live debate. IntelligenceSquared.com We have another naysayer who uh, I'd like to introduce, Richard Cork, to come up to speak against the motion. And uh, Richard is um, an award-winning art critic, art historian, um, long an art critic for the Evening Standard, the Times, and the New Statesman. So take it away, Richard. Thank you very much. I want to start by taking you back just over 100 years. On July the 27th, 1890, Vincent van Gogh borrowed a revolver on the pretext of shooting some crows. Then, in the verdant French countryside near Auvers-sur-Oise, he turned the gun on himself. After 48 hours of agony, he died in his brother Theo's arms. At the time, believe it or not, only one of his paintings had been sold. Even though Theo, who was devoted to Vincent's art, worked for one of the most important dealers in Paris. The contrast between Van Gogh's penury and the stratospheric value of his pictures today is utterly grotesque. But does the art market now behave any better in its appraisal of the best contemporary art. In commercial terms, the position of many artists in the 21st century compares very favorably with the hapless Van Gogh. Certain artists, even at the beginning of their careers, find no difficulty in finding a ready market. Some can sell their works for several thousand pounds each soon after leaving college and have no hesitation in turning down modest offers from impoverished devotees in search of bargains. The days when an early David Hockney could be bought for 50 quid are long gone. And even in these recessionary times, dealers are often prepared to push prices far higher and more quickly than they would in Van Gogh's era. This, in turn, reflects current thinking about the investment potential of modern art. Once it became evident in the money-mad early 1980s, corporate buying began to take hold in Britain. City firms, which previously would never have dreamt of acquiring art, suddenly started buying in earnest. Dealers began operating under names like business art galleries, <laughs> and paintings in offices became de rigueur. A headquarters with empty walls was thought to be culturally embarrassing. Boardrooms and other prestige suites were the first to benefit from this new outlook, but ever-rising sale room prices prompted companies to regard art collecting as a shrewd way to make money as well. Although some businessmen persisted in regarding art as a needless extravagance, they found themselves outvoted by equally hard-headed colleagues who pointed out that a collection could be sold at a financially advantageous moment in the future. When Willem de Kooning's boisterous painting called Interchange was auctioned in 1989 for $20.7 million, it set a new world record for a living artist. The price appeared to prove, once and for all, that really large sums of money could settle on work that had not been safely sanctified by time. Soon afterwards, though, the dire financial crash of the late 1980s and early 90s had its effect. Many artists whose bankability had soared now found, to their understandable dismay, that they were suddenly regarded as rejects. As a result, the unacceptable face of the art boom became manifest. No young artist relishes the prospect of instant acclaim if it can so easily be succeeded by disfavor. While footballers must hope for no more than a brief period at the top of their profession, the best artists ought to enjoy long and increasingly fruitful careers. After all, many of them in past centuries produced their finest work in old age. Why should their counterparts today be made to feel, at the age of 
30, that their best years are behind them. The ensuing bitterness might easily have a deleterious effect on their work. <coughs> well, I hope that today's young artists are not suffering in the same way from the current deepening financial malaise, but as apocalyptic anxiety about recession increases seemingly every day, I fear for them. At heart, we need somehow to reject the corrosive notion that buying art is tantamount to making money. If collecting continues to be seen solely in terms of its potential for profit, there is bound to be disillusionment when these heady financial expectations are not met. In the long run, the work of only a few artists will appreciate as spectacularly as the corporate buyers hope. History teaches that no generation produces that many outstanding painters or sculptors. Artists of the first rank have always been rare and their less talented contemporaries can hardly be expected to provide speculative buyers with heady dividends in 10 or 20 years' time. The truth is that an unequivocal love of art is the motive of every collector worthy of the name. Works should be bought to be cherished for themselves, not because they may be a ticket to early retirement. If the acquisition of art always arose from a passion for the image, as opposed to its commercial potential, the whole system would have much firmer foundations. Thank you very much. <laughs>